Hi, this is your host, Apni Bharatiya, and welcome to another episode of T3M, or topic of this month. And the topic of this month is security and compliance. And we have with us once again, Utpal Bhatt, CMO of Tigera, to discuss this topic. Utpal, once again, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Apnil. Yeah, again, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Pleasure is all mine. Let's start with some of the basics, which is more or less like if you look at the evolution of security from the tra- traditional IT word, legacy word, where software was kind of sold, somebody uh, will buy it, install it, manage it. So security was always someone else's problem. But now in the the, the cloud native cloud centric world, it is the problem of the developers. Things are moving towards developer pipeline. We talk about shift left movement. A lot of other movements are happening. Uh, So we talk about those things a lot, but what are you seeing uh, is the reality? What is the state of security in the multi-cloud cloud cloud native world vis-a-vis the traditional IT world? Yeah, I mean, I know I think the security has fundamentally changed with uh, cloud and especially the cloud native world. And everything you mentioned uh, all the way from shift left to different aspects of the application that need to be secured in all those we see. And uh, and it all started off with uh, as the application development uh, and the deployment became more automated, that it was uh, it was very important that security controls were introduced early in the development cycle, right? So we started seeing image scanning and further shift left to code scanning to make sure that you're catching these vulnerabilities uh, before you their deployment, right? And so we started to see that, and that was primarily because of the CICD automation. And uh, then we started to see yeah. Kubernetes orchestrators like Kubernetes that would uh, automatically scale up and scale down your workloads. So even there, you had taken away any sort of uh, a human intervention and uh, there could be security risks there too if the orchestrator itself was breached and so we started to seeing um, security practices being implemented within the platform team responsible for that sort of infrastructure and then finally the workloads uh, you know, of course the security team has to continuously monitor workloads for any type of breaches uh, but uh, we started to see the breaches now uh, the occurrence of the breaches uh, was uh, happening in many different ways, right? Now you could, the breach could come in from the network because all these applications are, you know, these tiny microservices, they're all communicating with each other. They're all communicating outside over the internet and with other applications. So you could be attacked from anywhere. And once you're attacked, the scope of the attack can grow very rapidly as these services are communicating uh, with uh, each other. And so we saw that the security teams had to now look at a lot of different types of threat vectors. You know, where are my threats coming on from the network perspective? Are my, is my container uh, breached? Uh, and is there malware there? Do I, how do I protect it from there? Is my orchestrator, is my CICD pipeline? So you see that security uh, folks had to think about a lot of different things all at once in order to secure their application. And that was a big change. Earlier it was, once it was deployed, that's when you start to think about it only from uh, the workload perspective. When I was listening to you, it, it, it sounds like, you know, of course, a lot of things are moving in the right directions, but we continue to uh, see a lot of breaches, of course. Uh, a lot of them are social engineering. Some are, of course, uh, bugs, which were fixed but never never patched and of course uh, api vulnerability that we saw in bookings.com kind of things are there so it does look like things have improved but uh, there are still a lot of areas to improvement so um, uh, when we do talk about you know all these movement of course uh, some of these breaches are actually in the big tech companies so we cannot even talk about the smaller companies do you think that when we do talk about the whole movement of shift left zero trust is it really being practiced or yes, companies do want security, but they are not fully implementing all these practices? What is the reality there? So, you know, the reality is that, uh, I mean, there are, I mean, if I think about a day in the life of a security person, I mean, it's become extremely 
demanding and complicated. And uh, that's because, uh, number one, because of these new kinds of architectures and applications, your attack surface is huge now. And uh, you have, uh, as we discussed, attacks coming because you're of vulnerabilities in your pipeline or in your orchestrator or communication outside or, you know, there are things inside your environment that are uh, advanced persistent threats that are moving laterally, et cetera. So number one, you know, there's a lot of, lot of uh, ways you're, you can get attacked. And uh, historically, the tools that were used or built for the security teams, you know, they were focused on one or two areas at a time instead of looking at all the attack vectors holistically. And so now, you know, in, in, on one hand, you have lots of attack vectors, you have tools that are kind of siloed. And then the third thing is that uh, because of these uh, attack vectors and siloed tools, you're also generating a lot of alerts uh, and sometimes a lot of noise, right? So from a security person standpoint, you know, who, if, you, if he or she has to look at all these attack vectors, if they have to have tools that are detecting vulnerabilities and attacks, and then they have to score and prioritize to make sure that who is, uh, uh, you know, where the imminent threats are and what needs to be addressed. It's a very complicated problem. And uh, I think that, my and my what we are seeing is that teams are trying really hard to address this problem so they are deploying everything we talk about whether it's shift left whether it's zero trust whether it's uh, you know runtime uh, security tools uh, etc so they're doing all that but the question is you know, is that really helping and there i think the end the jury is still out because uh, despite rolling out a number of these types of tools and these types of processes, uh, breaches continue to happen, the security teams continue to get overburdened, the development teams continue to complain about uh, app velocity and how security is becoming a business inhibitor and, and so on. So so while they're doing all these things, the is it all working? I think that's still a question mark. And you touched upon so many points that, you know, I was going to ask or I'll be asking about that as well. But let's start with, uh, are there any new threat vectors that you have seen in the recent time? Uh, we hear a lot about zomb zombie APIs and a lot of other things are there where you are like concerned, that, hey, these are the new threats that, you know, we will also talk about this whole complicated, you know, of course, cloud native still is complicated. And as you talk about all the alerts come in, it becomes overwhelming. But uh, that aside, are you seeing any new threats that should be uh, of concern? You know, in, in terms of, uh, so what we do is, uh, you know, where we do our own, on threat research, we also rely on a lot of uh, industry-specific threat research to make sure. So I think as a as an industry, we are seeing, uh, you know, I think we are seeing threats uh, across the board from all those three areas. We are seeing threats uh, because of, uh, a lot of uh, use of open source software and a lot of use of you know public registries, and so we are seeing that uh, you know, those are areas that uh, are uh, very uh, prone, very easily exploitable at these areas. So I think that's one big uh, source of threat that we we continue to see, and you know we continue to see issues uh, log four J vulnerability that we saw not too long back was again one of those examples. So that's number one. <clears throat> I think we uh, also continue to see our threat uh, actors becoming a lot more sophisticated. And so if you look at uh, you know, the MITRE uh, group continues to update their framework with list of tactics, and you see that those tactics are, are getting used uh, uh, in, uh, in conjunction with uh, some of the use of open source software. And uh, that's where we see... Uh, Either you are uh, kind of somehow making your uh, way inside the environment, you're doing privilege escalation, you're doing some defense evasion. So we're seeing a lot of a lot of that as well. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to point to say that there isn't a specific, one specific type of, type of attack that has increased. I would say in general, I would 
there are you know attackers are ex- using all these threat vectors and trying to get into your into your environment how much adoption of things like zero trust approach of course we talked about sh- uh, shiplet movement also uh, devsecops you know the, the, that security is not one team's problem is the problem you know that has to be looked at you know organization wide how much adoption are you seeing how much cultural change are you seeing there i mean as far as uh, our customers are concerned uh, everyone's aware of zero trust now uh, the implementation of zero trust uh, you know where and how pervasive that is you know that that depends on the different types of of industries we still see zero trust uh, principles uh, definitely at the perimeter level you know we see that uh, um uh, those are 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 getting uh, applied but when it comes to uh environments uh, like containers and kubernetes where there is no uh, there is no fixed perimeter and now you have uh, every single workload uh, conceivably talking and communicating outside and communicating internally we don't see as much usage of zero trust there yet what we see is customers who are are actually uh starting to realize that just by implementing uh, you know zero trust at the perimeter level but then uh, allowing traffic inside uh, you know that's that uh, so for example inside of a kubernetes cluster as you know that uh, each and every microservices internally can communicate with each other uh without uh, any sort of uh, controls there now uh, you know a, a zero trust principle would advocate that even a microservice itself has to authenticate that has to use the principles of zero trust and make sure that uh, you are in, you know enabling communication between services only when it's allowed and you're identifying or you know authenticating that service etc using identities so that sort of uh, i would say uh, uh, sophistication when it comes to you know implementing zero trust principles is, is still not there i think we we see that in terms of applications and devices we see we see that uh, uh getting used but not in terms of uh, microservices we still see uh, uh zero trust not being used as pervasively as it should be this year we started to see a lot of you know uh, restructuring with the organizations of course during covid times uh, companies you know overhired so now they are you know trimming their teams so we are seeing a lot of layoffs happening but we are seeing layoff across the board uh, do you see there will be any impact on security teams or cisos budgets as well you know yeah, absolutely i mean this industry is also uh, not i mean we are seeing uh, in the layoff, you know it's not that uh, the you know customers don't need uh, security or uh, security is uh, uh, but at the same time what we saw is that uh, over the last uh, few years uh, with the funding of companies and the rapid kind of growth of a lot of companies including a lot of security companies that uh, a lot of them may have hired uh, before the demand or overhired etc and so uh, if you look at uh, i think there was a publication there was a report by uh, a very prominent uh, vc out of israel who's invested in uh, almost 10 uh, or so biggest security companies coming out of israel and they mentioned that uh, they're going to see uh, uh, trimming or reduction in all of their portfolio companies so and that's what we see happening uh, we've seen uh, security companies uh, uh announce uh, uh layoffs as well so i don't think it's uh, immune to what's happening now let's talk about tigera of course calico is there as well um how are these solutions and projects are helping customers to improve their security despite all these budget cuts and limited resources they have today yeah yeah so you know at tigera i mean we have uh we have a very specific point of view right and the point of view is that uh in order to secure these cloud native applications uh, number one whatever solution that you provide has to be a, a complete solution in other words it needs to uh, look at it holistically it needs to make sure you are covering all the attack vectors you know all the way from 
your images, making sure your images are clean before they're deployed, to making sure that the posture of your configuration system, whether it's or, you know, Kubernetes, it's uh, robust. So you are comparing it against sys benchmarks. You are making sure you're doing micro segmentation, access controls, and then you have uh, all the runtime protection, whether it's from known threats or unknown threats, whether these come from the network or containers, right? So number one is, is complete coverage. Number two, what we see is that uh, the security teams are, because they are getting so uh, stretched thin across all the different things that they, de they have to do, the solution has to be plug and play. So it just has to uh, provide these types of uh, protection out of the box without requiring the security teams to configure rules or think about uh, the forensics and, and what the incident response should be. You know, the tool itself should be able to do a lot of that. And the third thing is in our philosophy is that you should always assume breach. Right, so it's a, it's not a question of uh, if you get breached, it's when you get breached, and everyone is going to that's going to happen. What is your mitigation uh, approach, and are you going to be able to deploy emergency measures to to prevent that breach from becoming into a disaster? And that kind of drives what we do at Tigera. So the first thing is that uh, you know we've we've created a CNAP that provides uh, comprehensive protection against all uh, security threat vectors. And uh, you know that includes your build time threats, your config threats, and your runtime threats. With regards to configuration, you know, we provide capabilities like out of the box micro segmentation, egress controls. Uh, we provide capabilities like integrating with your firewall. And then when it comes to runtime, Threat defense, uh, we provide out of the box uh, protection against both container based threats and network based threats. And these could be no, from known attackers or from uh, zero day threats, right? So that's kind of number one comprehensive protection. The second thing we have done is we have uh, our environment is completely plug and play. So you can get started within minutes. So, you know, you go to tigerr.io, sign up for, you know, to, to Calico Cloud. And within 15 minutes, you're up and running. You can deploy controls over your cluster. Um, the detectors we provide are out of the box. You don't need to configure anything. Um, the protection uh, such as uh, IDS IPS or workload-centric WAF, all that is provided and enabled out of the box, right? So the time to value is incredibly uh, fast there. And uh, the third thing we provide is that uh, in our we believe in defense in depth. And so we always assume breach and we provide mitigating controls. So you are able to automatically deploy compensating controls in the case of a breach and contain the scope of that breach. And that's what uh, you know, Tigera, Tigera does. Um, and I, and in, in our approach, we strongly believe is aimed at this new class of applications that just require a different way to think about security. Uh, before we wrap this up, the last question I have for you is that, yes, solutions are there. Of course, we are seeing some positive trends also there. What advice do you have for companies so that they can improve their security posture? Because tools themselves are not going to help them. They need a lot of, you know, culture, you know, as we discussed, they need a holistic approach towards security. Yeah, I mean, I think they, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. See, tools, uh, tools are, uh, it's just one thing that you have in your in your uh, list uh, in, in your kind of uh, bag, right? So it really starts with uh, from a from a mindset, right? You really have to have a mindset where you are first starting off with uh, improving the security posture and trying to reduce the attack surface, right? So there's no point in spending a lot of effort on detection when half of your work can be made easy by just implementing just good practices when it comes to uh, your uh, CI CD pipeline, when it comes to configurating your orchestrator, when it comes to kind of isolating your workloads. And there are lots of uh, easy wins there. I think that's number one. Number two is that, uh, you know, you should always uh, 
I mean, it's all about defense and depth, right? So you can't go for uh, an approach where you're going to put 10 locks on one door. You know, you really have to make sure you're locking your front door and locking each and every single room inside your house as well. And I think that that is, again, very important. Uh, defense in depth to have multiple layers of con- security control so that if someone gets through to one layer, you know, you're always, uh, you always uh, uh, are covered. And then I think the second thing is that the third last thing is that there needs to be an empathy between the different kinds of roles involved in and their their needs in order to get the uh, security of the application robust, right? For example, the developer is under the pressure to push out applications. Meanwhile, the security team has to make sure that the applications that are getting rolled out have the you know, lowest probability of getting breached, right? So I think the idea of uh, kind of helping each other out with the right kind of insights. So for example, getting the developer teams a prioritized list of things that they should address instead of, you know, here's everything you should need to fix or having the development for the development team to make sure that they're adopting good, uh, code scanning and image scanning practices so that the number of things that are pushed into production have fewer vulnerabilities, right? These are the kinds of, uh, I would say, processes and more collaboration that needs to happen between the two teams in order for uh, overall, I mean, security is not just the responsibility of the security team, it's the responsibility of everyone involved. Utpal, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this topic. And as usual, I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Swapnil.